So, so here's the real deal. If this is all there is, if this is it, why not be selfish and self-centered? Why not just do everything for yourself if this is all there is? And so today when we talk about this idea of being firm in purity, Paul goes from talking about, he's been encouraging the early church in 1 Thessalonians, and then he gets to this chapter, chapter 4, he begins encouraging the church to do what's right, to live a pure life, but he doesn't stop there. He says the ultimate goal is to recognize that this life is not all there is. And that is really one of the main reasons why we live a life for Christ. So we're going to talk today about how to be pure in an impure world. Now, my first church, uh, when I was a kid, my home church, I should say, made a huge mistake. Because they put me in charge of cleaning carpets as a teenager. And I knew nothing, I'm talking zero, about cleaning carpets. Since then, I've learned lots about cleaning carpets, mostly through error and error. I would say trial and error, but it was just error and error. And so I learned one principle from my mom, which I applied to my life. And my dad used to get on to my mom for the amount of soap she used in the dishwasher. He really thought that we went through several dishwashers because of my mom's dishwashing method. Her dis dishwashing method went like this. They had the, we had the powder that you poured in the dishwasher, so she would put powder in the cup. She would put powder in that second cup, close the first cup, and then she would throw some extra soap because soap is good for things. The same applied to washing machines and everything else. Therefore, I thought more soap for floor cleaner was good. So we had this one spot at church. Now, my church was built in the 70s. My dad actually laid all the block for our church for free or paid for it to be laid, which is a great donation to the early church. I am the third generation who has been part of building a church in my lifetime. And so that's something that I look back and realize my grandfather did. Of course, my grandfather's the one that when that church closed, asked for a refund. But that's another story for another day. It's a true story. Anyway, so they had this one spot on our beautiful yellow and black carpet. <clears throat> 70s kids, all right. And thankfully, it wasn't shag. But anyway, so yellow and black carpet. They had this one spot, and it was where the door opened from upstairs Sunday school. And all the adult Sunday schools had coffee because they were Christians. And um, apparently, where the door was, everybody spilled coffee there, like everybody. And so there was this huge black spot of coffee. So, of course, I went, and for the very first time, I, they said, I want you to go clean that spot. And so, of course, I was in charge of the wet dry vac, and I figured also hot air water's better, which, by the way, if you have stain guarded carpets, it's the opposite of that is true, so just so you know, don't use super hot water either. But anyway, so I put, oh, I don't know, a lot of cleaner in there, and to the point that you could see the suds as I was using the wet dry vac, but, but it was beautiful. It took up all that spot. And about a week to a week and a half later, that spot actually looked worse than it did before I cleaned it. And it was amazing. And now it was a square spot instead of a round spot. It was now a big square spot. And what happened, I found out, is, is that, uh, and the maintenance guy came to me and said, how much soap did you use? And I just said, a lot. And he said, you realize it's the water that actually cleans things. The soap just makes the water clean better. You're better to use more water and less soap than more soap. And so what had happened is I had put so much soap on the carpet that the carpet now was picking up all the dirt from the sticky soap that was attracting the dirt. When I went back just with water and cleaned the carpet, now the carpet was clean. Now I tell you that story to tell you this. Most, uh, well, every religion, but sometimes even as Christians, we make the goal purity. Because we think if I do a lot of good things, then maybe, just maybe God will be happy with me. 
and be pleased with me and I'll get into heaven. And the opposite is actually true. When we focus on purity, when we focus on sin management, we actually become worse in many cases, more selfish, more self-centered. Ramadan is going on right now, if you didn't know it, and the Muslims right now are trying to make God happy by not eating all during the day. Some are even refusing to swallow their own spit, and they will not have that even happen until nightfall. Why? Because maybe, just maybe, if we do enough deeds, then maybe God will be happy with us. The awesome thing about Christianity, and in Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And so it's not the soap that's doing the cleaning it's the water. Is soap still a part of that? Is purity still a part of it? Absolutely. But when we really recognize not only what God has done for us, but the fact that God has given us as believers an eternity, it creates a new thought process in us where instead of saying, I'm going to do stuff to try to make God happy, we recognize God absolutely loves me. And so what does he want from me? Because as we recognize his love for us and we fall in love with him, it flips around and we begin to understand it's not a works-based religion. Jesus has already done everything for us. It's the opposite of works-based. Every other religion is works-based. Christianity is all about, you ready for this one word? It's all about surrender. It's all about surrender. And so today, as we look at this idea of how to be pure in an impure world, we're going to talk about the idea of our goal in pleasing God. Our motivation is love, and our reminder is the hope of eternity. So let's look at number one, the goal, pleasing God. Let's pick up here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We've moved on to chapter 4, and we're going to do all of the chapter today. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. And then it continues, in fact, you are living. And so remember, he said to this early church, hey, you're overcoming uh, persecution. You're dealing with struggle. You're being attacked for your faith, just like we were. By the way, Paul and, and, and uh, Timothy, only there a few weeks. Now, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, and that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother and sister. Time out. Let me go back to this word sanctified. This word sanctified is a Greek word that literally means to set apart. It also means to be holy. The word holy means to set apart for a special purpose. And so I'm going to give you my illustration that I've given so many times that I did not bring a rake. When I watched a special on how potato chips are made, I... Love potato chips a little too much. And I love Cape Cod potato chips way too much. And I have an issue with barbecue potato chips that involves not being able to stop when they are near me. But as I watch this special, they get to the point where they're flipping the potato chips over. And I look and there is a rake. I mean a yard rake. I mean, it is the rake you could buy at Ace Hardware. Now, I looked it up, and they say it's a special rake. I can tell you that I could go to Ace Hardware and literally find the exact same rake. I don't know if they paid an extra $50 for it, and somebody bought it at Ace Hardware and said, this is a potato chip rake, and it's an extra $1,000 because it's for potato chips, but I can tell you it is the same rake I have used in my yard. And I can also tell you this, if that guy took that rake and said, this is a nice rake, I'm going to take it home this weekend, and he raked his yard and then came back to work, that rake is no longer holy unto the potato chip, right? 
You would no longer want to dip that in potato chips. And the truth is, that's the idea of holiness for us. It's the idea that God has set you and I apart. There's, there's nothing as wonderful as babies crying. And Randy said, if a baby cries, it's not our baby because there's another baby in church and that's who's crying. Just so you know, that's not Randy. Actually, it's Randy crying. It's not the baby. So, so here's, but we love having your, let them cry. We don't care. All right. So, so here's the deal though. When you're set apart for a purpose, the idea is it's still the same thing, but now it's used for potato chips, right? The truth is you've been set apart as Christians for God's purpose. And he says, therefore, don't give into this passionate lust. And that literally is the idea of cravings. I don't know if you've ever had a craving for something. I don't know if you've ever gone to the freezer and that thing that you hid in the freezer. By the way, if you're smart and have kids, you put it in a vegetable box. If you haven't learned that lesson yet, you just aren't parenting right. Grandkids, same way. They will come to your house and steal your food, so you need to put it in a vegetable. It ought to be like a, 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 the worst vegetable you can think of, okra box or something, right? And then there's that chocolate, and in the middle of the night, you wake up, ooh, you just want a little piece, just a little piece, and you go get it. That's a craving. And the Bible says that we should no longer run after all the things we used to run after. Even if our desires are the same, don't run after the same thing. And then he continues, who don't know God, and then he says, the Lord will punish all who commit such sins, and we told you and warned you before. Because God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy, and here's that that word, Greek word, again, the same Greek word for being separate, for being sanctified, for being purified, a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction doesn't reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So why does God care about how we use our bodies? The same reason you would care if that rake was used in somebody's yard and then you bought some potato chips. It makes it impure. It's now hard for it to accomplish the same purpose. God has a purpose for you. More and more studies demonstrate that when we use our bodies improperly, when we go after things that the Bible says are sin, over and over, more and more studies say that that causes issues not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. Selfishness and self-centeredness seems to be the greatest thing when we're feeling selfish and self-centered, but it is how we destroy one another. Now, you heard me talk to the kids about testing water. One of the things that happened to me about water that I never knew when I lived in Titusville and my kids were little, one summer I went to the pool store, I bought some test strips because I said I want my kids to have the water ready and I bought some chlorine from the store and I filled up the pool and as I got the pool full, I took the test strip, I dipped it in the water that I drink, the water that I drink, I just want to emphasize that again, the water that I would drink right out of the tap, I dipped it in there and I looked and it said, you don't need any chlorine. And I went, these strips are broken. So I went back to the pool store and I said to the guy, dude, I haven't put a ounce of chlorine in the pool yet i just dip this in the thing and it says i don't need any chlorine to which the guy looked at me and goes yeah i went what do you mean yeah he said there's a ton of chlorine in the water that you drink and i went ah he said there's ammonia in there too but that didn't show up on the test strip i'm like why did you have to tell me that and so I discovered that the water was very different than anything I thought. And here's what I want to tell you for you. One of the first things that changes when you run after the lust of the flesh, when you run after, I'm going to do what I want and follow my cravings and do whatever I feel like regardless of what the Bible says. And people will tell you, how dare the Bible tell me something's wrong? Hey, God created the owner's manual. You can take your car four-wheel driving, but if it's not made for four-wheel driving, can I tell you, it's not going to go well. You can ask these guys who go off 520 all the time. That's another story. 
But the truth is, God made you for a purpose. And the test strip, when you become selfish and self-centered, when you get away from love, then it's hard to do what God's called you to do. It's hard to love the people around you. It's hard to, fill, to live a fulfilling life. You can gratify the flesh, but your soul will be empty. You can gratify the flesh and be so depressed you can't stand it. But when you say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. And when you blow it and you mess up and you fail and you falter, you say, God, would you purify my heart? In Romans 12, it says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Which means when you blow it, when you mess up, you go back, you climb on the altar. <laughs> you say, God, I'm a sacrifice to you. God, I surrender to you. You know, the Bible calls God's purifying our heart a fire. It's this, this whole idea of a refining fire. And I say to God, can't it be refining jacuzzi? Because fire's hard. And when you start to deal and look in the mirror at the sin in your life and the why of the sin and the truth sometimes that we're just selfish and self-centered and we have to confess to God, God in my own flesh, I'm selfish and self-centered. I want what I want when I want it. And how dare anybody get in my way? By the way, some of us that struggle with anger, the reason we struggle with anger is we don't get what we want when we want it. We're like a three-year-old. How dare they be in the left lane? Oh, I'm sorry. That was me this morning. I'm sorry. Actually, it was the opposite this morning. I drove in the fog and I was like, you people are all crazy. You're driving like I normally do. Number two, the, the goal is pleasing God. Number two, the motivation is love. Now, about your love for one another, we don't need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. When I take the test, you guys love each other. And in fact, you do love God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and make it your ambition. Some of you introverts are going to love this verse. To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. This, was on the, this next part of this verse was on the very first penny in America. Did you know that? It came from this verse. It wasn't just Ben Franklin being a jerk. It came from this verse. He said, you should mind your own business. You want to quote a verse to somebody? You can just do that part, right? Mind your business. What? I'm just quoting scripture. <laughs> and work with your hands just as we told you why. So your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and you will not be dependent on anyone. One of my favorite things that happened in the last few weeks is somebody called me and said, hey, do you know of anybody who's got work? I really need to work. So I called a friend of mine. I said, hey, do you know anybody who's got work? He goes, I have this terrible job that this person can do if they want. I'll take good care of them. So I sent the person over. They, they agreed that the job was terrible. The boss called me back and said, I just want you to know that person's awesome. They work so hard. The Bible says that our work ethic is a reflection to unchurched people, to people who don't know God. The way that we work, the things that we do, other people say, can I be an example? I want to know that person. By the way, one of the things I've learned over the years is people love to talk about work. If you want to get a guy in a conversation, ask him about jobs he used to have. If you want to really have fun, say, what's the worst job you ever had? You won't be able to get him to be quiet. What's the worst job you ever... Some of the guys are like, now, like, can I tell now? Can I share now? Right? And, and, and the truth is there's something about work in us that we understand that work is important. In 1 Timothy 1.5, he says, the goal... Paul says again, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Now realize, our goal is not to appease God. Our goal is to please God. Don't mix those two things up. 
Pleasing God means we understand, because of what it says in Romans, that it's His kindness that leads us to repentance. It's His kindness that changes us. It's His kindness that makes a difference in us. And yet, what do we do? We're not trying to earn our way to God's love. And that's, I, I, listen, did you know that babies this time of year will be born underweight because of Ramadan? Muslim babies will be born underweight. Why? Because pregnant mothers trying to please their Allah, who is not the same God that we have, will say, we will not eat in order to make our God happy. Our babies will suffer and be born underweight because we've got to make God happy by what we do. And like I said, some of them won't even swallow their own spit because maybe, just maybe, that'll make their God happy enough that they'll make it into heaven and avoid hell. You don't understand how big of a deal it is that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. That is different than every other religion. Instead of us going to God, God comes to us. And so our response to that should be, God, thank you so much. I'm so overwhelmed by your kindness that it makes me want to do. What do you want me to do for you? If somebody bought you a car today, before you left church, they said, I bought you a car. It's out here in the parking lot. You wouldn't say, you jerk, get away from me. You'd be like, is there anything I can do for you, sir? And the truth is, God has given us eternal life. Rick Warren said this, the best use of life is love. The best, best expression of love is time. And the best time to love is now. Number three, the reminder, the hope of eternity. I'm going to tell you a true story. I get to tell part of it at funerals, but I want to tell you the whole thing. And you can actually get on my Facebook and look this person up and see what they're doing. And you can spy on them like a crazy person if you want. Did you look them up last night, Michelle? Not yet. Oh, she did. Okay, so here it is. So when I was a college pastor, my very first ministry, I was early 20s, had no idea. Still don't have any idea what I'm doing, but at least I can fake it better now. And so had no idea what I was doing. I had a, a 18, 19 year old who was played softball for Florida, Florida Tech, or as it was called then, FIT. And she slid into a base face first. And as she did, she felt this horrible pain in her side, went to the hospital. And when they did scans, they found that she had a large cancer the size of a softball that bursts inside of her. And so Sue began chemo, they did uh, surgery, and they started chemo, she lost all her hair. Now she will tell you that she doesn't remember any of this. And I said, it's okay, I'm your pastor, I remember all of it. Some other students even shaved their heads in solidarity, I mean it was amazing. The students supported her and took care of her, it was, it was wonderful. And so Sue did all the tests, and then she went back for that recheck, that dreaded recheck that we all know about. And as she went back to the recheck, they found more cancer, this time a golf ball size cancer. So she came to me, and she said, Pastor, she probably just said Eric. She said, I'm afraid. I said, why are you afraid? I said, are you afraid because you don't know Christ? She goes, no, I, I'm a Christian. I've given my life to Christ. And we went through all of that. I said, well, what are you afraid of? She goes, I don't know what's next. I said, well, heaven's next. She goes, I don't know what that means. And as a 20-something, I just know that God put this on my heart. I looked at her and I said, have you ever sat on the beach and seen a sunrise? And all of a sudden, you're overwhelmed with that sense of peace. I said, have you ever been in the mountains and saw a sunrise or a sunset? And all of a sudden, you were overwhelmed with that sense of peace? I said, that's just a touch, just a taste of the peace that's in heaven. I said, when you leave this earth and you go to the next life, that's what you will have. More love, more joy, more peace than you've ever experienced. The most you've ever laughed, the most you've ever felt loved is nothing compared to the love of heaven. 
And Sue said, okay. So a few weeks later, she had to go back to the doctor. They wanted to do a retest, and they were going to do surgery, so they opened her up for surgery to take that tumor out. And when they went in, there was no tumor. And Sue was healed. And Sue today teaches school, God bless her, in Colorado, near Denver. I still talk to her now and then. The truth for all of us is we never know. We don't have a date on our foot, regardless of what a nurse or doctor tells you. But the truth is, we all have a limited time on earth. But the awesome thing is that we have hope for eternity. Listen to what it says. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Don't you love how death's called sleep? I love that. So that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. By the way, people ask me all the time about people who are non-Christians and stuff. And I always say, I don't know. I, I can't imagine. I, I have the opportunity to give hope to people. To remind people of what really matters. Because here's the truth. What matters today when there is no eternity is very different than what matters today with the hope of eternity. And recognizing that life is a lot bigger than the here and now. For we believe Jesus died and rose again, and we believe God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that those who are still alive or left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, and you always wondered about the trumpet, here it is, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we will be with the Lord forever. And then it says, encourage one another with these words. And let me say to you, sometimes you need to encourage yourself with these words. When you're dealing with a problem in life that seems overwhelming, when you're dealing with a situation, when you're, listen, listen, when you're disappointed with yourself. Because when I talk about purity, you go, I'm really failing in that area. When you feel like a failure, or you feel like a reject, or you feel all alone, encourage yourself knowing that this is not all there is. So what can I do in the meantime? Love other people. Care for other people. If you live a selfish and self-centered life that's all about you, you will be miserable. I promise. Tried it. Been there. Done that. But when you say, God, use me. God, help me to love people. Show me how to encourage somebody today. Even on your worst day, when you're discouraged and depressed and frustrated and you feel like a failure, you still can encourage someone else. And that's one way to get your eyes off of you and recognize that life is bigger than the here and now. Jesus said, my, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. In the King James, it says, in my father's house are many mansions. The truth is, can I tell you this? Jesus built houses are better than anything we can imagine. Amen. So don't worry about how big it is. <laughs> When my friend Bill died, he was diagnosed with cancer. He knew that he was dying. It came back about the third time. And he read a story about a lady who had terminal cancer. And she went to her pastor and said, Pastor, I'm concerned about death. And he said, You've been to one of our potlucks at church, haven't you? Which, of course, she looked at him like he was an idiot. Which is a normal look I get all the time. She said, yeah. He said, they come and they serve the food, right? Yeah. He said, and then at the end, what do they say? They say, keep your fork. Now, why do they say keep your fork? Because they know the best part's coming. It's time for dessert. And she, he said to, the pastor said to this lady, realize that when you die, the best is still coming. So keep your fork. So when my friend... Bill died. Before he died, he said to Tim Goff and I, who were good friends, we went to breakfast every week. 
He said, would you guys put a fork in my hand after I die so that people will wonder why there's a fork in my hand as they come up to see me? So without telling the funeral director, Tim and I went up to that casket and we got a fork in Bill's hand. And when I got to speak at Bill's funeral, I said, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. And I want you to know if you're a Christian, the best is yet to come. Your best day here is nothing like your worst day in heaven. <laughs> if you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, I'll be here after the service. You can come and say, Eric, I want to know that I have the hope of heaven for eternity. And so I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. The fact that Jesus died because you couldn't pay your own debt. You can't earn it. You can't do enough good stuff. I don't care if you don't swallow your spit for 40 days. You still won't earn your way to heaven. But the truth is, when you surrender to him and you say, Jesus, I surrender my sins, my garbage to you, and I take your holiness. The Bible says when you follow him, that he gives you eternity. That's the goal. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and the truth is you've lost hope for a lot of reasons. I want to encourage you today to refocus your life on love and eternity and purity. Ask God to change your heart and your life. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love. Lord, I thank you for your word that reminds us not only to be pure and to be unselfish, but Lord, also to love others. Father, also that you have given us eternity. Help us to not forget that this is not heaven. So, Lord, right now I pray and we surrender our hearts and our lives to you. Lord, any area of impurity in our lives, Father, right now we put on your altar and we ask you to purify our hearts, purify our minds, change us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.